You'll stick on it. Can you can you wait actually? Okay. You need to say good. Oh, okay. okay. It's fine. Hey, that one. YouTube. So that if you feel to share your slides, uh, I'm going to introduce you and then you're going to start. Sounds good. Give me one second. No, 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 it's just a beam that's we are good. No one's changed our <laughs> <laughs> Can you guys see the slides fine? Yes. Okay, so we are going to start now. Uh, welcome everyone to this Safari Live seminar. Uh, in today's meeting, we have here one of uh, Safari's long-term collaborator, uh, Professor Sugata Goes. Um, uh, Sugata is an assistant professor at the at, um, University of Illinois, born in Champaign, where he has his own research group called Arcana, really nice name. And prior to joining uh, Illinois, he was with us here in Safari in Carnegie Mellon Lecture, not in Zurich, but he was a postdoc and a senior researcher over there for some time. And yeah, we did a, a lot of great work together. Uh, personally, I have a lot of gratitude for Sugata. He has been working with me in my, in my PhD journey so far, uh, working on processing memory, which is a topic that we're going to talk about in today's Safari Live seminar, uh, which after he left Safari, uh, the Safari, started his own research group, he continuously uh, working on and doing great research on that uh, subject. Uh, so Sugata, I hopefully I didn't miss anything super important in the introduction. Oh. But feel free to start in, in if you're ready. I'm going to collect uh, questions from the YouTube uh, YouTube audience. So feel free on YouTube to ask any question uh, to Sugata. And uh, when it's appropriate, you're going to stop here to ask the questions. So uh, feel free to start, Sugata. And welcome to this opportunity. Thanks, Geraldo, for the uh, overly generous introduction. And hi, everybody. Um, it's good to see a bunch of familiar faces. And for those who ha haven't met before, um, here's hoping uh, you'll pick come away with something new. So as Geraldo mentioned, uh, a lot of the work I've been looking at has been really focused on this idea of you know, how do we solve data movement issues in modern computers? And so as a quick introduction for those of you that may not be you know, as familiar with this, um, as we look at the modern types of applications that have emerged over the last, let's say 10 years, there's this huge increase in the amount of data that they're processing and manipulating you know, uh, at any given time. And you know, sometimes when I say this, this triggers people to think about you know, you know, as uh, three examples, the domains that I have uh, shown here. Databases, graphs, and machine learning are often the things that we think about when you, know, you tell somebody who's somewhere in the broader architecture community, oh, there's a lot of data processing applications that we need to care about. Um, but it turns out that while these are certainly data, uh, data centric and uh, data intensive, there are many other domains that you actually see this in. Uh, for example, drones and self-driving cars, it's an area that we don't really think about all that much, but in reality, whenever you're trying to do navigation, when you're trying to make decisions, when you're trying to use, um, you know, uh, figure out like, you know, optimal routes for, for all sorts of different metrics, be it delivery, safety, uh, timeliness, all of that kind of stuff. There is a ton of data that's being processed by these systems. You're picking up, you know, gigabytes of data per second from things like LIDAR, radar, sonar sensors, all of these things. There's a ton of information that has to be processed. 
fairly close to real time to be able to get this you know, decisions out uh, in a safe way for these vehicles. And this is particularly interesting when you look at drones because drones are often you know, constrained by the amount of battery life they have, especially these small miniature drones that have been appearing in recent years. Um, there's some work that you know uh, we've looked at in collaboration with uh, you know, other folks at Safari about precision medicine as well. Um, the amount of data that you need to be able to do things such as you know, um, uh, genome sequencing, which can allow you to discover ailments or track viruses, that can be large amounts of data that needs to be processed sometimes in very remote areas. And it's actually one of the big hurdles to being able to deploy you know, uh, rural uh, genome sequencing. You need a ton of data processing power. And right now, uh, we have to throw a lot of you know, uh, compute resources to even make that happen. And you might not think about it, but mobile workloads are also you know, very data-centric these days. Um, we have a study that uh, you know, we've done in collaboration with you know, folks at Safari and with Google that I'm not going to talk about today, but uh, some of you might've seen it before where it looks at uh, several popular mobile wor uh, workloads, things like browsers or you know, uh, video decoding for browsing YouTube. Um, and it turns out that even those applications that we think because they run on a smartphone or on a, on a Chromebook that they can't be data intensive actually can generate a lot of data movement. Uh, and so data-centric applications have really become a large part of the space that we, uh, you know, uh, computer users deal with today. Unfortunately, when you look at the computer systems, they really have not kept up in any meaningful way with that transition. Uh, in fact, many of the ways in which we design computers still harken back to the original von Neumann uh, computing model that was proposed in the 1940s. Essentially, it's very compute focused. And over the years, as we've been processing more and more things, we've made what I'd argue are very beefy, solid processing engines. And this can be any flavor of compute engine that you have. And we, for the longest time, optimized them for performance and throughput. Now we're also optimizing them for power and energy. But what's happened is that we have these very powerful and efficient processing engines. But they're really designed for infrequent memory accesses. Even if I need a single piece of data and all I need to do is you know, read it or flip a bit and not use it ever again, I have to take the data out of DRAM, bring it across this bandwidth constrained high energy memory channel and percolate it through all of the caches to get to the processing engine that it needs to compute at. All that takes time and it takes energy and it's straining a lot of fixed resources that we have within the system. And to make this worse, as we uh, applications becoming more and more data centric, our traditional notions of locality have gone away. And so where the caches could help offset some of these problems before, that doesn't really happen in quite the same way anymore. And so what we have ultimately is despite you know, many significant achievements in the architectures over the last you know, 70 odd years, uh, we still have what are largely compute centric architectures. And for those data centric applications, they're wasting more and more energy and time simply because of the inefficiencies of design. And so the work, you know, one of the main bodies of work that I'm looking at in my research group um, is this idea of PIM, processing in memory. Some of you might've heard the term near data processing before. Essentially the idea is to actually fix the way in which we design these computers. Instead of having the data have to go across the memory channel and through the, through the caches of the processing engine for simple computation, we can add some sort of compute capability into or near the memory that can actually perform some operations for low locality data in place. And this is not a new idea. This idea has been proposed as early as 1970, but for many, many years, the technology really wasn't there to be able to enable these uh, PIM concepts. But over the last decade or so, uh, we've seen a lot of innovation on the memory architecture side that has taken PIM from this sort of you know, interesting idea that has a lot of merit, but is difficult to build because something that is actually practical to produce. And in particular, this comes from two main avenues, this, uh, these new memory architectures and the, the ability to use heterogeneous integration with these memory architectures that allow us to bring certain types of logic much closer to the memory than we ever could before. And the thing that I'm gonna talk about today, if you look at the memory devices themselves, there are actually ways that we've discovered where they can interact with each other um, without having to add significant additional logic. In an ideal world, this can actually enable cloud-free computing at the edge. And I'll talk about this closer toward the end of my, um, of my talk. 
But the bottom line here is that we can introduce new types of data processing that are actually fairly efficient, uh, that can unlock computing in ways that we didn't really think about before. And it's important to note that, you know, there's a, because of these innovations in the last decade, there's been a lot of research that's evolved and has really advanced the state of the art forward, I'd argue, very significantly in the last decade. And that's actually led us to the point now where we have real PIM prototypes that exist in the market. Um, and before I go any further, I'm gonna, uh, these days, you know, uh, if you see a PIM talk, the new Moore's Law slide that you have is essentially, what's your taxonomy for PIM? Uh, and so I'm just gonna give you a little bit of an overview so you can get a sense of, you know, the terminology that I'm using here. Um, and so PIM, I'd argue, breaks down into two types, uh, two subcategories, processing near memory or PNM. This is essentially that heterogeneous integration approach um, kind, uh, kind of design, where you add discrete logic either into the memory chip or very close to the memory chip. And there are a number of ways to do this. Uh, this is most popular with 3D stack DRAM or with silicon interposers but it doesn't have to be limited to that in, in any way. And there are successful prototypes that have done this with conventional two-dimensional DRAM as well. Um, and there are a number of examples of this that you can actually get on the commercial market today. Uh, as you know, many people in Safari are, I'm sure, familiar with, you know, Upbem has been making their big data accelerator for a few years that has, you know, to my knowledge, was perhaps the first uh, truly commercial crossing near memory station that was out there. Uh, in the last year or so, Samsung has introduced the Aquabolt architecture. It's gone through a bunch of different names as they try to figure out how best to market it. I think at one point it was called FIMDIM or FIMPIM and now HBMPIM. Um, but the bottom line, it's the same rough architecture where you have um, you know, logic that you're adding near the banks of the DRAM itself, you know, right around the same place as the peripheral IO circuitry that you used to have. The second approach to PIM is what I call POM, processing using memory. And this essentially allows us to take two memory cells, turn them on at the same time, and then they do meaningful work, right? You would think that if we turn on multiple memory cells, that would normally be a short or something weird would happen. But it turns out that uh, in many memory technologies, there are actual useful uh, operations that those types of devices can do when they're turned on at the same time. Um, and I'm going to come back a little bit in a minute about like the different ways in which memory technology supports this. There are actually many different ways that uh, you can enable this today. Um, but again, there are prototypes of these out there. For example, Mythic you know, has been marketing their analog matrix processor, which does PUM using NAND flash to try to do analog matrix multiplies. And IBM about three years ago or so announced uh, the Hermes prototype chip, which was looking at how you could use phase change memory to be able to do these types of analog multiplies. And so we're at a point now where- Sorry, you know, sir, I have a question here. Uh, related oh yeah, go ahead, Jalo. PIM prototypes. Uh, as you as you rightfully said, like PIM is like quite an old idea, right? The front papers were from the 70s. And in the early 2000s, there was also some, a lot of excitement about the industry related to, or at least industry plus research and academia related to PIM. With some uh, one with some prototypes coming from academia, right? For example, the IRM prototype or infrastructure, sure. Eva infrastructure, uh, Terrazis, I guess, from 1995, also. Yep. Uh, but in the end, all of those architectures uh, paid out over time and didn't actually uh, get, made it into the commercial uh, market in, in bulk, or even didn't found a particular uh, niche for them. Uh, do you think that now is different? Uh, now that uh, we motivated previously with the increasing uh, problem with the data movement in many, many workloads and domains. And do you think now there is a more drive for processing memory to actually catch up for this time around um, uh, in the in like in real systems and real, real prototypes? Sure, that, that's an excellent question. And, and the short answer is yes, I think uh, you know, it's not always the cleanest of metrics, but I think when you look at what industry is pushing, that's often a good indicator that there's demand, right? Industry doesn't just make products because they feel like it, right? They don't do it just because it's cool research. And, and I think there are two big factors that are there. One is that our hand is being forced more than it was in the past. The, the emergence of these applications has made it that such that, you know, we have a lot of 
idle resources in computers today for many of these applications. Uh, we have a number of studies that have looked at this in various contexts, including, you know, all some of the work that you know, we've done together looking at Daymov, um, among other things. But many compute resources go underutilized because we have fundamental limitations in memory channels, right? Such as you know, the number of pins that we have available on a package uh, for a CPU, right? And those have always been there, but as we are, you know, if you look at the growth in data that's being generated every year, it's generally a quadratic chart. In fact, I used to have a chart for this um, in my slides uh, somewhere, but, um, but yeah, it essentially we're, we're just, the amount of data we're generating in society is exploding every year, right? And so we've gotten to the point where that's a lot of the work that we do now in ways that it wasn't even 10 years ago. And so when you combine that with the fact that we've made it significantly easier to produce these things at scale, right? Like the academic prototypes were great steps, you know, in the nineties and the two thousands. Um, and in fact, there's still the work that stemmed out of that. Uh, you know, Peter Kogi, who was one of the big, you know, innovators of the early PIM movement, you know, was actually, you know, were, had startups looking at this kind of, you know, work over the years. But I think the, the fundamental changes in IO connectivity and the ability to solve some of the you know, integration problems that we had in the past are really what have helped on the technology front to make this much more possible than it was. Right? Whereas I think IRAM was a, was a CMOS only solution that had like reasonable scale, but it had a lot of difficulties from trying to merge those at the time. Yeah, so Excellent question. Thanks a lot for the, for the answer. So guys. Hey, sure. you can, can I? Yeah. Uh, great. You can hear me, right? Yes. Perfect. Um, it, it's just a small curiosity, I think. I'm, I'm just curious, like, we have a lot of examples from industry here. Um, do any of these vendors uh, include or support, let's say, an SDK to bring the programmers on board to this new platform? Like, are they thinking about it as a platform or are they thinking it, about it as a product? That's an excellent question. And so I'm seeing your back, but is that Adi? Is that you? Uh, sorry? Well, who is this? Yeah, this is Adi, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm, I'm just seeing the back of your head, so I actually wasn't sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I guess you can oh. see. <laughs> okay. um, no, that's an excellent question. I'm actually going to talk about that later on toward the, the, the end of the talk, because there are certainly SDKs that are available, but I would argue that in their current form, they are either not enough to support, I think, the widespread adoption of these types of architectures, um, and they often focus on, you know, domains where you get the biggest bang for your buck with, you know, the more uh, reasonably minimal SDK. So, you know, companies are thinking of these as platforms, but they're doing it in ways that can help them, you know, that, that, that don't make this necessarily fully general purpose. And I think that there is a path to expanding that to hit all the different applications we talked about before. Um, but there are hard problems along the way that need to be solved to get to that point. So, so for example, um, you know, Upmem has you know, an interface that you can use to be able to program their, their uh, DPUs, right? And you can actually you know, get code running on there. Um, but I'd argue it still requires some you know, reasonable knowledge of the hardware, the hardware layout and things like that. It doesn't have some of the conventional attractions we're used to. Um, as a different example, Samsung's chip is essentially, they're using it only for machine learning at the time. And they're basically uh, writing their own replacement um, you know, uh, gem libraries, right? So you drop this in for a matrix multiply. You don't have to change the line of your code. You just change the library that it's targeting. And then you can get this you know, to, be able to uh, do uh, you know, matrix vector multiplies, matrix matrix multiplies, you know, just like your code was doing. But that does limit it to predominantly machine learning or matrix oriented problems. Absolutely. Does that answer your question? That is a very interesting answer and a lot of food for thought. Thank you. Sure. Uh, any other questions for everyone? All right. So, um, and this is actually, you know, as you can see here out of the very next thing I want to talk about, right? Like, you know, uh, these ideas are really cool. We have prototypes for them, but are these practical at scale, right? These are all ultimately prototypes and early products. But as you saw, there are many applications that can benefit from this. So why aren't we using them for all these applications? And I think there are a number of questions that we have to answer. Um, you know, as we're doing processing memory, and particularly if we're doing something like PUM, we have to think about lifetimes of devices. 
Uh, as oddly mentioned, we have to think about programmers and how they use these chips, right? It's easy as architects to come up with these new ideas, and it's the it's an important first step. But ultimately, you know, we have to think about how we actually do this, you know, um, integration at a scale in ways that people can incorporate them to their programs. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what I think the the roadmap to that is. And then the thing that I'm going to focus on for much of the talk today is how can we especially from the academic side, think about practical manufacturability, right? It's one thing to think about these ideas. Um, and there are things that industry is clearly, you know, uh, working on prototyping, but there are other types of architectures that could be of benefit uh, that are yet to see, you know, the light of day. And some of that is because uh, some of the assumptions we make are not often the best in academia. And I'll, you know, I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Um, we also have to think about, you know, the markets that are at play here. Uh, machine learning is, of course, the uh, the topic of the day. There's a lot of interest there and a lot of interest in accelerating machine learning with various types of hardware. And so that's some of the things that you see in, you know, for example, Samsung's products um, or the uh, Palm prototypes from Mythic and IBM. They're focused on machine learning. But as I mentioned, there are a lot of other domains that can benefit from PIM. And so what are we leaving behind? And is there a way for us to be able to capture those types of benefits? And ultimately, that makes us think about how to design for other applications. I'd argue that the cost of trying to amortize specific ASICs for other applications and even other domains can be a harder sell because you have to have a large enough market to justify you know, absorbing the uh, non-recurrent engineering costs of designing these chips. Um, it's hard to find a domain as big as machine learning that has that kind of uh, customer base. And so an alternative to that might be instead of designing our ASICs for specific applications or specific domains, looking at general purpose data processors that are reconfigurable that can get you most, if not all of the benefits of these ASICs, but in ways that you know, it can be used across many domains and actually give a much broader market for industry to actually absorb these costs. And so ultimately to do this, I'd argue that we need to work across the entire computing stack. It's not enough anymore for us to work in our silos. It's not even enough for us to work you know, uh, in you know, our domain and maybe one adjacent domain. We really need to start you know, reaching far up and down the stack if we're going to have PIM uh, survive in the long run and not just be some cool product that died an early death. So that I have a, a, a comment more than a question related to the sure. topic that you're talking about. Uh, based on my experience, work, I'm, I've been working in process memory since 2017, I guess, and when submitting papers for uh, post memory papers to conference, uh, sector conference, in the beginning, uh, I was working on accelerating particular uh, uh, applications like database, for example, for ping, and a, com a recurrent uh, feedback that we were receiving for the reviews were like, oh, you are proposing this ping architecture, but it's just for this particular application. Uh, this is not going to propose, like, this is, never, this is not going to make in the market. And then I have an impression that over time, uh, this flipped, and now you are receiving feedback like, oh, you are too general purpose, uh, you are not accelerating my favorite machine learning workload, this is useless. And, and I, I saw this flip, but I still believe there is a, still a, a, quite a large space for general purpose processing memory. So, um, because of similar uh, comments that you said, like about the cost and the stack, all of those problems. Uh, but I would like to actually see your opinion about those two uh, design decisions. Should we go for general purpose or should we just find some niche applications and go for them on, on how you see the current state and the future of process, process memory architectures? Uh, like, would you favor one of the other or do you think that is a space for both uh, or a market space for both, I'm trying to say? Over here. I mean, there may be a market space for some ASICs. I, oh, sorry. Somebody else want to say something? No, no, I think we didn't have anything here. Oh, room. sorry. I thought I heard something there. Um, yeah, so, so I think that there's definitely a space for both, but I don't think that we can take quite the same path as we've been doing with accelerators. And, and honestly, even with you no know, uh, you know, conventional close to CPU accelerators, we have some of the similar you know, issues that, we, that we're that we gonna be dealing with with PIM as well, right? Um, accelerators are a tough sell because you have to integrate them you know, into your applications. You often don't have good APIs for them. And even if we have APIs, you know, it's not like they are universal designs, right? My favorite example for this is machine learning accelerators. You know, there's a neural engine in almost every phone today, right? 
But despite that, the number of applications that use them is actually very small outside of the actual vendor provided stuff, right? And that's simply because there aren't really great APIs for them, right? We have a few like NNAPI and, you know, Apple's neural engine because of its larger market share often gets a lot of attention. But the truth of the matter is we often leave these resources unused or un highly underutilized because, you know, it's picking the flavor of the day in many cases, right? And application developers don't have the bandwidth or the expertise to cater to every last variant that's out there. And that's for something like machine learning, which you know is, is definitely like you know, the most popular thing you'd want to try to adopt here. And so, you know, I, I think that there is room for ASICs, but it's gotta be in the right market, right? I think that we've been making strides in machine learning because it is sort of the, you know, the 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 hot topic of of you know interest across many aspects of computing right now. Um, there are some areas, you know, um, such as I'd argue genomics um, or databases where there are high value applications that can potentially benefit from specific ASICs and can absorb the higher costs for, you know, for the type of benefits they provide. But what I'm actually gonna argue for today is going to be a more general purpose approach because I think that it's, it, is, it will be the more helpful of the, um, uh, of the next steps to get us towards adoption. And then, you know, at that time, I think once we open up PIM being a much more commonplace thing, then it's much more easier sell to have these types of multiple domains. So. Yeah. Thanks a lot for that. I sure. a, yeah. uh, Hayu has a question for you. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, go ahead, Hayu. Uh, talking about the, like, uh, to do the uh, ASIC style or the, to do the general purpose uh, compute processing memory, I'm thinking about that, uh, and for now, it seems that uh, most of the PIM, they focus on the, I mean, processing using memory, they focus on the edge device because um, like, uh, it's like ASIC design for, and it, you can benefit a lot from the edge device. And uh, uh, so it's like uh, really uh, intuitive to uh, design them as, as an ASIC thing. And, you don't need to design them as a general purpose processor processing in memory device. But uh, what do you think that uh, should we also do processing using memory inside the, uh, in, in maybe the personal computer or maybe in the data center or cluster? Do you Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. I'll talk a little bit more about this uh, uh, later on in the talk, way, but. Um... One thing I'll mention is that, you know, you mentioned that, you know, ASICs have a place in edge computing, but in reality, when people are saying that we're going to use PUM for the edge, we're talking about machine learning at the edge, all right? It's, you know, it, it's a fairly limited thing. And as I'm going to talk about toward the end of the talk uh, of the seminar today, there's many more things that you can do on the edge besides machine learning. And that's becoming more and more prevalent as we're developing new types of edge devices. And so I, I think that, you know, ASICs for the edge is a short-term solution to solve what we immediately want to do on the edge, but there's going to be many more use cases that we're going to see, you know, because this can has the potential to change the inflection point of, of, you know, what's more efficient to do. Is it more efficient right now to send off the data to the cloud, which is what we currently do, or can we bring more of that processing beyond just inference, you know, locally? Yeah, agreed. Thanks. Sure. Uh, sure. Sorry. Um, you mentioned in your slide that you know we need uh, to think about the worst type like software architecture system devices. Is. And if you want to adapt fast, right, we need to look at uh, the at level C system device we have today. And based on what we have today, we have enough to start building uh, PM uh, for general purpose uh, application. Sorry, could you repeat the last part of the question? Because it's a little hard to hear. Yeah, I also didn't get the question. Uh, my question is. For what we have today from the circuits on the device physics, uh, do we have enough to start building general purpose PIM systems? That's actually going to be the basis of my talk, in fact. And so, <laughs> um, so hang tight for a few minutes and I'll get to that because you know, I, I argue that we, we are getting there. We're closer than some people think and we're farther than some people think. <laughs> but it's a matter of, I think, trying to really work together, right? Um, I'll talk about this a little bit more at the end, but I, I think there's actually more of a disconnect between people, particularly working on the devices and the people working on the architecture about what's needed to make this go forward, right? And that's, we, we essentially have some, you know, a, a little bit of dilution across that boundary. And it's in part because it's, 
you typically don't have communication very readily across those two domains. And so, but yeah, um, and that's actually one of what I want to focus on today, right? Um, I'm going to argue that if you want these you know, new types of hardware uh, to really be successful and you want to make them practical, you need to cooperate across all these levels of the stack. Um, and this uh, means understanding things like the fundamental limits of the materials themselves, right? Um, architects often have this habit of, oh, cool, here's an IEDM paper. There's a table here. Let me pull the table, put it in my simulator, and ta-da, I can build new architecture. And it's not the right approach, and it ignores all sorts of realities about these devices. And so one of the works that I'm going to focus on today is stuff that we've been looking on called RACER, uh, where we actually sat down with material scientists, device physicists, and circuit designers to understand uh, the limitations of what you could do with for, for processing using memory, and how you could build practical devices even with those limitations that were there. Um, and to that end, you know, we actually fully synthesized, you know, a full front end, peripherals, circuits, interconnects, um, and uh, uh, memory arrays with back end line integration um, to be, you know, to understand the actual ramifications of a complete re-RAM based chip. Uh, and in doing that, and I will caveat these numbers because, as I mentioned before, this is from you know materials and devices up to architecture. There's still no like you know OS runtime, virtual memory, things like that. So these numbers should be taken with a grain of salt as you should every like um, project for now. But as I'll show you, we can get you know for data intensive micro benchmarks an average speed up of 107x and average energy savings of 189x compared to a 16 core Xeon CPU. And the work that I'm going to talk about today is predominantly from this you know collaborative team that we have. Um, going from the, you know, the system software and architecture side all the way down through device physics and materials with uh, some of my collaborators at uh, CMU, uh, Rick Carley, Jim Bain, and uh, Marek Skaronski. So that we have another question here in the room. Uh, after sure. Yeah, so I want to ask what general purpose implies to say, like, in this context. So is, are we talking about regarding any applications that we can run on our computers today, or are you talking about some broader space than what we have for AZ solutions? Uh, I mean, it might break the flow at this point because uh, you already talked about AZ, but uh, and maybe you're going to talk about this in the future. In the, uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about this in a, in a few minutes. In fact, my very next level will touch on some of this. For now, you know, I think a lot of what we want to look at is um, broadening the capabilities, right? In an ideal world, it would be great if you could just take your application and run the whole thing on here. And we think that there is a path forward to doing that. Uh, although there will certainly be portions of the application that are more efficient to run uh, in, you know, um, in memory or near memory, and there will be portions that will be more efficient to run on the CPU. You can imagine that if you have the choice and you can balance the two, it's great to divide things and run them on the most efficient system. Mm -hmm. But there also may be cases, particularly at the edge where you know, we're highly resource constrained and we can't afford a memory array and a conventional CPU. And so we might be able to take the inefficiencies of doing some of those operations in, in memory and, and supporting that full on execution. But uh, as you can imagine, there are many more roadblocks to, to making that happen. Okay, thanks. Sure. And so this leads me to, you know, the, the next thing I want to talk about. So I'm talking about research, but before I know, want to go over a little preliminary stuff with processing using memory. Um, and so today I'm going to focus on PUM because that's where our cross stack efforts are. And there are a number of different memory technologies that actually support this. Uh, I'm not going to go into this in too much detail in the interest of time. Um, and these are all right now, um, no, they, this includes like digital and analog operations, but it's just far from a comprehensive list. But what you can see is that, you know, PUM is actually capable, uh, something we can do in both conventional memory technologies, some of the ones that we've had for decades, and in emerging memory technologies themselves, such as RERAM and uh, magnetic RAM and uh, phase change memory. Um, and you know, there's a combination of different types of operations, some stemming from general purpose Boolean operations to the analog multiplies that we can do or dedicated searches and uh, TCAM uh, search operations. And so there's a wide range of capabilities that are here. But today I'm going to focus on RERAM because that's the area where we were actually working with, you know, the uh, device business and material scientists. And so this is the device that we expect trying to understand. 
And it's a reasonably promising candidate. If you look at RERAM, um, they're often arranged in these two-dimensional uh, uh, arrays. And the particular type of topology we're gonna to look at is 1S1R, although nothing prevents us from using, so 1S1R being one selector uh, device and one resistive memory switch. You could also do 1T1R, which is one transistor, one memory switch, but um, you know, we will, uh, we're gonna focus on 1S1R for the time, being, just because it's, it's a little bit easier to integrate into uh, the uh, chips. And so typically these types of devices are arranged as a cross point array where you have a metal column, um, the, uh, the resistive memory switch and the selector device in series and a metal row line. Um, and at the intersection of every row and column line, you have one memory cell. And it turns out that there are a number of different types of operations you can do with these uh, RERAM cells, depending on what voltages you're applying and how you're interpreting the output. So resistive RAM is typically doing things in the current domain. Um, and so what will happen here is that, you know, you're going to have some analog interaction between multiple RERAM cells. And you can use this for, you know, dot products and low precision multiplies with multi-level cells. So that means multiple bits in a single cell. But we're going to take a look at something that was proposed by um, Shara Kapitinsky's group from uh, Technion uh, back in 2014. And it's this idea of being able to do NOR operations inside single level RERAM cells. So each cell has one bit. If I float the row line that is shared between three cells and I apply a specific NOR voltage to two of those cells, which I'm gonna call my inputs, that floating line is eventually going to have um, the NOR of the operation that's there. This is essentially you know, your, your typical like you know, voltage law equations that are uh, applying here um, based on the resistance of the element that's going on here. And what we can do is by grounding the third line of, of uh, the third column line for the output cell, we can drive that current coming out of the, uh, the summation of these two inputs into the output. And we can use that to program this third cell with what will now be the NOR of the operation of the two inputs. And so this is attractive because this is reasonably doable with you know, uh, voltages that are you know, that the arrays are capable of today. Um, and NOR uh, is a universal Boolean operator. So it can allow us to perform any kind of Boolean logic operation. And as I mentioned before, we've seen, you know, as I showed you in the chart, there are a number of different operations like this that have been demonstrated with different technologies. Sometimes they need more than two cells, but the general idea is the same. Turn on a bunch of cells at once, some sort of you know, voltage-based or current-based function is going to be applied that's going to result in some output that's, um, that you can save as a meaningful function. And so when we're looking at these, you know, this, we have this choice between looking at the multi-level VRM cells and the single-level cells. We're actually going to focus on single-level. And part of the reason I want to do that is because um, these devices, if you ever look at their IV curves, and I'll show you one later on, I, I should have put one here, but I apologize, I did not. Um, um, the IV curves are actually highly nonlinear, and it makes it difficult for us to be able to divide the windows into enough you know, different, so divide the, uh, the total span of the resistances that a cell is capable of into enough windows to support the multiple levels that people want. And so for these low precision multipliers, people have been looking anywhere from, you know, two bit to five bit values. And while in theory it's good and it can work for operations that can tolerate approximation, if you want precise multiplication, um, it's very difficult to make this work with the non-idealities of the device that exists today. Whereas with single level cells, we can essentially go to the edges and avoid the, that non-linear sort of, you know, um, exponential curve uh, region. That allows us to have, um, you know, fairly safe operations, albeit at lower density. And so one of the things we can do with those digital operations is to combine all these NORs together into bit serial computation. Um, and the quintessential example of bit serial computation is a ripple carry ad. Um, if I have a multi-bit addition, I'll take the least significant bits, I'll add them together, generate the sum and the carryout for bit zero. I will propagate bit zero to, you know, bit zero's carryout to bit one, do the computation there and do it bit by bit until I get my sum. Um, 
And it turns out that NOR capable VRAM can perform a wide array of these bit serial functions. But for those of you that remember this from, even back from like, you no, know, like early digital logic, we don't build ripple carry adders today. And that's because bit serial operations can incur very long latencies, latencies we often don't need to pay. Um, and so in CMOS, we can often design around these uh, with you know, more sophisticated uh, technologies. But that can be difficult with the types of operations that we do in RERAM just because it requires a lot of coordination and additional circuitry that we're trying to avoid. And so what's been popular to do is to, instead of you know, doing bit serial operations on just a pair of cells at a time, we're doing them on pairs of columns. And so in each column, I'm going to compute you know, the bit zero edition for let's say 100 or 200 different um, uh, addition operations. Effectively, what we're doing is exploiting data level parallelism that is possible to do because of the uh, structure of the cross point array. And so all this sounds great. And people have been proposing architectures for this for some, you know, for a few years now. You know, some of them to amortize the long latencies of bit serial computation, you know, are making columns that are hundreds, if not thousands of cells long, right? As you can imagine, the taller the arrays, the um, you know, the more throughput I'm getting. And so while I'm not bringing down the latency, I'm basically using throughput to make up for the uh, uh, overall performance and actually uh, perform a lot of the circuits. But in sitting down and actually analyzing what was going on with the devices, what we found was that um, there are a number of issues, um, and, and this is certainly true for RERAM, but this is uh, expected to be true for other memory technologies as well. Um, and what's happening is that as we increase the crossbar size, um, you know, while that increases the throughput, um, it actually also increases the amount of current that we need to drive um, on the uh, on the uh, row lines or on the column lines of the array. So much so, and, and this is more current than we need to be able to access data. And it's in part because it's actually driving data through the cells to be able to program a third cell. Um, and so you can imagine that as I make my column one cell larger, I'm proportionally adding that much more current to drive it along with some parasitics that are involved. And we quickly approach not fundamental into the device, but actually you know, the current carrying capacity of the metal wire that's you know, um, connecting these arrays together. Um, and this, if you're not careful, can actually permanently damage the metal wires. Um, we have some analysis of this in our Micro 2021 paper on Racer. I'm not going to go into any, uh, too much detail there, but what we found is that effectively, while we'd love to have columns that are you know, hundreds or thousands of you know, uh, cells tall, it's actually only possible to do within the fundamental lens of technology if our column lengths are less than 200 cells. And this is a problem. In memory technologies, small cells are bad. And they're bad because we now have to amortize lots of peripheral circuits, right? We need peripheral circuits for each tile. And um, you know, those are often very expensive for memory devices. Um, we need to lay them out and isolate them. Um, and so this creates a whole bunch of additional density issues that we are, you know, are not used to uh, dealing with. And on top of that, for POM, I now can't get thousands of cells to make up for the bit serial latencies. So how can I make up for those bit serial um, overheads? Is it possible or is it just dead with these small tiles? And these are the questions we actually set out to answer with Racer. And we actually designed an architecture that is compatible with these small tiles and can actually work within the limits of uh, RERAM. And so Racer starts by looking at how we organize data. Uh, in state-of-the-art memory architectures, we often keep chunks of a word in a single tile. Um, depending on the technology, that can be the whole word or that can be you know, some of the bits of a word, um, like the, the, the data beats or something like that. It really depends on the specific technology. But in Racer, we take a different approach. We take each bit of a word and send it to a different tile. So um, I don't know if you guys can uh, see my uh, cursor. Yes, we can see it. Cool. So this tile over here, for example, would be bit zero. This tile over here would be bit one, this would be bit two, and this would be bit three. So we're essentially striping the bits across tiles. We're designating a tile to a bit. Um, and the striping allows us to take advantage of a number of benefits. So if you remember with bit serial operations, we communicate things from bit to bit, like the carryout information. And so what we can do is we can add simple column buffers that are connected with pass gates between each of the tiles. 
What this allows me to do is to transmit data from one tile to the next without electrically connecting the tiles together to double the size and bring us back to the current capacity problems. And without having to use um, uh, ADCs or DACs to be able to get the domain, uh, to get the value out for our conventional CMOS logic. Essentially by using reram column buffers, we can keep the values in their existing domains and simply just transfer them by uh, you know, uh, connecting one side of the buffer to its neighboring tile. And so this technique allows us to have our communication, but it also provides a new opportunity for pipelining. And this is you know, the second key innovation that we have in RACER, this concept of bit pipelining. Before we've thought about pipelining across operations, across wards, but in, in Racer, what we find is that, let's say we have this tile over here, tile zero. And so this diagram is showing you the same four tiles and the, how their, their operations are changing over time going down. Um, uh, here we have the carry out being generated for a column of wards. I'm gonna call it column A. And uh, this is bit zero of the carry out. So I'm gonna generate that. I'm gonna propagate it through my column buffer and I'm gonna pass um, the carry out to the next tile, which will operate on the next carry out, right, bit one. But what you'll notice is once I've passed this information from tile zero, from tile zero to tile one, tile zero is now idle, it's not doing anything. And it's isolated from tile one, it has nothing to do with it once the buffer disconnects. So we can simply just start a whole new set of operations on that idle tile. And that too can propagate in parallel with the operation on that first set of wards. So now we're operating on, let's say 64 wards for, uh, for A and in parallel, another 64 wards for B. And we can do this throughout the entire um, structure so that we can, for let's say a 64 bit ward, be pipelining 64 columns worth of operations at any given time. And so this new type of pipelining is, I'd argue fairly simple, but it's actually the key to buying back performance because now I can take T tiles, tie them together and treat them like the stages of a pipeline. And then I'm essentially multiplying my throughput that a tile would give me by T. Now there are a couple of other benefits of bit pipelining. Um, one of the things that we set out to do, which several architectures often overlook is that we wanted to actually look at what the control circuitry for this could look like. Um, it's great to have this concept of actually propagating data and you could sure manually map things and feed you know, commands in. But in reality, you need to think about what the control circuitry would look like because that can often be the killer in terms of area and energy overhead if you're not careful. And so what we did was we fully designed these, um, the circuitry to take advantage of the fact that in bit serial operations, each bit is repeating the same exact operations. You know, I'm doing the same XORs uh, and ANDs to generate the, the sum and the carry bits for my addition. So why would I regenerate the instructions for every tile? Instead, what we do is we design a series of micro op queues where we queue up uh, our NOR instructions, which we call micro ops. And we call them micro ops because multiple NOR instructions can do meaningful work like an add, a subtract, a multiply, a compare. I'll show you more of those in a second. But then each tile in the pipeline, each pipeline stage has its own dedicated queue telling this tile what to do for its NOR operations. But then what we do is that, no, we take the uh, instructions coming out of micro op Q0 and as they're being dispatched to the tile to execute, we're also feeding them into the tail of micro op Q1 so that when tile, uh, tile zero is finished, tile one can basically reuse those same instructions to execute on its tile now. And so we form what we call uh, byte groups where we can feed in one instructions worth of micro ops to a single queue. And we'll propagate them across all of the micro ops of a byte group. And so now we can reuse instructions across eight different tiles for giving us byte operations. But we can also tie with optional gates, multiple byte groups together. And so much like a regular CPU, we can now support operands of flexible granularity from eight bits all the way up to 64 bits, depending on the type of data we're looking at. And so this is one of the things that we were able to get from bit pipelining that allowed us to simplify the design of this circuit uh, and of the, of the racer chip. But then the second thing that we got was that we were able to develop a much more scalable design. 
So here we have a reram cell and we're tiling it in a 64 by 64 arrangement, which is a safe limit within that 200 cell column design that we had. And then what we do is we take 64 of these tiles and arrange them into what we call a pipeline or a core. Essentially, this is the unit of work that we have where we have our instruction queues propagating uh, instructions from tile zero through tile 63. Uh, we take multiple of these pipelines and we combine them together with a single shared set of pipeline control circuitry, read-write circuitry that can allow us to enable equivalent IO to a DRAM controller, and a pipeline selector that chooses which of these 64 pipelines that we can fit in the cluster or active at any given time. And so we can have one or more of these pipelines on and they can share the same instructions, essentially kind of like a multicast operation. And we can have IO coming out of this two megabyte cluster, as we call it. This allows us to amortize what would otherwise have been large uh, peripheral overheads and share them across multiple tiles in an efficient way without sacrificing the throughput. And the nice thing is that this cluster is its own independent compute unit. Um, and that based on um, uh, how large or how small a chip you want to build that can cater to the system that you're designing, you could build a chip that has a single cluster or that can have many clusters inside there. Uh, within a four centimeter squared area of a chip, we can actually put in 4,000 of these clusters so we can get an eight gigabyte density of reram, including all of our instructional logic and peripheral circuitry. And we do this within you know, uh, thermal and power envelopes that are you know, typical for passive cooling in real chips. And so this gives us a nice building block. Now we have this hardware that we can sort of stamp out as we please. And one thing we can do that we've done is, it, you know, while we expect that much of the work will be done within controllers, we do expect, within clusters, sorry, um, we expect that there's a need for communication across clusters as well. And so we will allow for um, IO controllers to be able to move data in a mesh-like network quickly across these clusters. And so this is at the hardware level. Beyond that, we want to provide an architectural attraction that starts thinking about software problems. And the way we do that is we take each of those pipelines and designate them as a vector core, what we call a racer core. Um, it's essentially a core that has 32 kilobytes of data. Um, essentially, this corresponds to the 64 tiles in their buffers. Uh, and it has local access to data from 512 cores in total, including itself, um, either the cores in its own cluster or cores in directly neighboring clusters. And using those IO controllers that showed you with that mesh network, we can give each uh, core NUMA like global access to the entire chip's data. Uh, we did some studies that you know, uh, in the paper to see how, um, you know, uh, how often we would use these. And for the workloads we were looking at, the network that we designed was fine and, and suitable at like a fairly simplistic design. Uh, we're actually looking at more complex designs for larger scale problems now, um, uh, but I'll talk about that offline if anyone's interested. And so with the subtraction of a core, we came up with this vectorized ISA that allows you to you know, compute on 64 words at once. You can choose the word granularity from eight to 64 bits. And you can not only support uh, bit pipeline operations and uh, bit serial operations, but a bunch of non-bit pipeline operations as well. So we can do things such as multiplies, multiply accumulates directly as a single operation, divisions, you can use uh, quartic um, algorithms to perform a lot of you know, things like square root and your, some trigonometric functions. And so this is a starting point for what I'd argue is fairly flexible types of computation within Racer. And so with that, um, I'm not going to spend too much time on the methodology, but I just want to note that we compared against four platforms here. Um, and we did ISO area comparisons to four of them, to all four of them. So we looked at a 16-core um, Xeon 8253 that had eight gigabytes of off-chip DRAM. Um, we looked at an embedded MRAM version of that, a hypothetical one that we came up with where we could provide eight gigabytes of MRAM on-chip. This allowed us to essentially see, are we simply solving the data movement problem or are fundamental things about Racer enabling more than just cutting out the data movement costs across the memory channel? Uh, we also compared against a, an RTX 2070 GPU and we compare it against a uh, duality cache, which is an in SRAM uh, Palm architecture that uh, came out of the University of Michigan a few years ago, um, one that they actually uh, take out earlier versions of. 
Um, and we developed models at multiple levels of the stack. Um, we looked at in-house uh, uh, nanofab devices. We built a detailed Verilog A model for this. Um, we used free PDK nanometer to look at the circuits. Uh, we extracted numbers about you know, current and future regram devices based on the predict, uh, predictions from papers and trends that we're seeing. Um, we developed a new simulator that looks at the actual core of the cluster and the tile. Um, and then we compared that to a, you know, a system looking at, you know, um, you know, that can support like, you know, uh, CPU, memory, and energy profiling. Uh, we've open sourced the simulation framework. It's available uh, on the Zenodo archive and on GitHub if you're interested. Uh, but, you know, jumping to the results, what we can see here is that uh, on the y-axis, I'm showing you speed up. On the x-axis, I'm showing you uh, so the micro metrics that we looked at, they come from, you know, domains such as, um, you know, uh, machine learning, image processing, uh, data searches, a uh, number of sort of common application domains that we have today. And what we find is that compared to the baseline, the 16 core Xeon CPU, Racer in green gets 107x speed up, as I mentioned before. If we were to move the memory for the Xeon core on chip and use MM for it, we still would get a 71x speed up over that. And this is because the embedded memory on its own doesn't reduce data movement between the memory and the CPU. So while we're cutting out the memory channel, there's still a lot of movement between the CPU, the caches, and the memory itself that fundamentally PUM can take care of by not needing the CPU at all. We also see a 12x speed up versus the uh, RTX 2070. And uh, I haven't shown it because it's a different baseline before ISO error comparisons, but we get a 7x speed up compared to the duality cache. Because unlike the SRAM, we can support much greater density um, uh, on chip. And so we don't have to keep going back to memory when we spill out of what the SRAM has. On the energy front, we see similar, almost absurdly high gains. 189x versus the CPU, 94x versus the embedded uh, MRAM, uh, 17x versus the GPU, and 30% uh, versus duality cache. Um, we pared down the problem sizes for duality cache to be fair to duality cache. Um, for the application that triggered frequent data swapping between the cache and lower levels of memory hierarchy, uh, we found a 5x savings in energy. And so, you know, you might look at these and be like, okay, huge numbers. Of course, I don't believe it. If I were to review, I probably wouldn't believe it either. And, you know, part of this is because, you know, these are great benefits, but these are hand-tuned micro benchmarks, right? There are non-micro benchmark code that you have to consider or transitional code. You have to think about the overheads of, you know, system software and, you know, uh, compiling and, you know, all of the, you know, the, the slowdowns that, you know, a full stack can potentially provide. But we'd argue that we have fairly healthy margins here that allow us a lot of room to be able to build those types of tools and still get away with a lot of the games. And so um, I'm going to skip this slide in the interest of time. Um, this is a little bit of a comparison to justify where some of the energy savings on the VRAM side are coming from. I can come back to it afterward with questions if anyone's interested. Um, but before I go on, are there any questions about the racer work? I have some questions. Uh... Sure. Let me enable my video really quick. So uh, and then I had some, uh, some questions. I'm trying to organize them uh, in a logical way. So my first question, I think, uh, would be about the, the the programming model that you are employing for, for Racer. Uh, you said that you're using vector instructions, right? Because of the way that you're developing the clusters and, and, and yep. the... Um, and, it, and as you also know, uh, from those processing using memory solutions, like. Uh, uh, even uh, Duat Cache and also Syndrome, all of them have, have in common with it, all of them leverage this, uh, this vector, vector execution mode or vector instructions or <laughs> in the mode for, for, for extracting parallelization from the application. Uh, do you think that uh, we are set uh, for that? Like, SIMD is the best for processing memory solutions and we should just develop around that or was just what makes sense for those particular works and we still have uh, room to investigate other uh, execution paradigms that could benefit from um, processing using memory. Like, I don't know, uh, multiple data, multiple instruction, multiple data, or any other of the combinations of the taxometer. Uh, well, definitely so. the latter. I think that there's a lot of room for, you know, data parallel and task parallel operations. Um, you know, for those of that are interested in particular, Nathan Beckman at CMU has been looking at a lot of task parallel models for taking advantage of PIM and PUM in various ways. 
Um, and in our group, we're looking at data parallel programming models um, that go beyond particular SIMD. SIMD is a great starting point, right? But SIMD suffers from the same problem that we often deal with with SIMD, which is that you, know, you get a lot of inefficiency when you can't pack the vectors and it's difficult to deal with things such as control flow and, and uh, divergence and you know, uh, things like that. Um, they're not unsolvable problems, right? I mean, GPUs give us a, a potential starting point for some of that. And in fact, Duality Cache built its SIMD support around a CUDA-like model, right? A, a simplified CUDA model. And that's you know, potentially one interesting way to be able to look at some of this kind of stuff. But the trade-offs are a little bit different and it is still, you no. Know, there are no good solutions for that control flow in PUM today, right? Short of, you no. Know, in, in Racer, we have some simple predicated execution support so that we can do merges and actually make some simple decisions, but it's not great for nested branches right now. We have some work that's looking at how to solve that problem um, you know, going forward, but it's, uh, it's not easy because you have to think about nested branches and a lot of complexity in terms of you know, supporting what I'd argue real applications do. But that's a place where I think um, SIMD is a great starting point, but we will outgrow it very quickly. And if we want to do more meaningful work, we need to think beyond to the more complex data parallel, task parallel models. So uh, thanks for the answer. I have another question related to, to that, how you're distributing data. Uh, so uh, both uh, Racer and Wild Cache and uh, SIMDRAM, talk about SIMDRAM because I'm the author of that paper, uh, use a bit serial mode, but Racer is uh, fundamentally different, right? That because in SIMDRAM and Wild Cache, uh, you need to uh, align the operands in a single column, the bits from the operand in a single column to the computation. So there's a lot of problems of transposing data, for example, back and forth from a horizontal data layout to a vertical data layout. Mm -hmm. And here, I guess you eliminate a little bit of this problem by distributing the bits of a word across the different uh, tiles and then uh, doing the computation in a pipeline okay. uh, matter, right? Uh, do you think, uh, did you actually evaluate if, uh, if, if that is fundamentally better than transposing the data uh, in rerun, for example, in the same memory technology um, uh, in terms of throughput and latency of the operations. And so, so go ahead, Drago. I was just going to add in a second, uh, uh, in a second question would be, do you think that would be possible to do the same in, a, in dual cache, for example, uh, or, or on other technologies, or is a feature that Rerun maps nicely to to this type of paradigm, and and then not necessarily SRAM or DRAM will do uh, so good over there because of I don't know area overheads of control sure. logic or peripheral logic. Yeah. So to answer the first question, when we did our comparison to Duality Cache, um, we did not include the transpose oper overhead that Duality Cache actually has. Right. We were we were trying to be fairly you know like optimistic towards Duality Cache's performance. And you know, as as you all know, right? Like in duality cache and SIMD RAM, those transposes can be a fairly significant cost in terms of the performance, right? Um, and yes, inherently the cross point design of racer, right? Like the and, and really the cross point uh, arrays that are being used for RAM allow us to do a number of interesting things. In fact, this product first came around when I was talking with you know uh, some of the device folks and how we could do multi-dimensional memory accesses, right? From either the row or for the column that morphed into this instead, right? We don't use that in Racer. We still use it as a column only approach, but our buffers allow us to take the columns of data and then serialize them so that we can get one word out at a time as a coherent word in parallel, right? The buffers allow us to get that flexibility without transpose units and to do it you know, within a single cycle. So she move, then the, the buffers can act as you know, shift registers to be able to pump out data uh, at that's speed. So cross point arrays do give us an advantage here. Um, we think that, that it's possible to do this with other memories, but it's not clear if that's universally true. For example, with DRAM, right? Um, if you are willing to pay the cost of rearranging the bits and chips, yeah, I think you get something similar out of there. But that's already a big ask, right? Because that starts taking, you know, uh, DDR protocols that have existed for a while and completely breaking them, right? We have better opportunities probably in, in SRAM and caches because you know, as far as the black box is giving us you know, um, you know, the word of data that we want, we don't necessarily care how it's organized internally. Um, but one of the big things that we're curious to see is how you could support the, the Boolean operations inside the array. 
right? If you look at duality cache, they don't do most of their operations within the SRM cells themselves. They're actually adding um, CMOS logic just outside the SenseAmps parts. The SenseAmps do some work, then they've got some additional logic outside the SenseAmps to help fill in the functions that the SenseAmps themselves can't do. Right? And that's more costly, right? Because that's still, it's, it's a more common conversion because we do it all the time for caches, but that still requires a conversion, right? It still requires the amplification of the signal and that's, you know, that hinders your performance and actually um, ups your energy costs. So yeah. I think that answers both questions. Both yeah, questions. yeah, I was thinking while you were answering. No, that's fine, I just want to make sure. Yeah, and uh, thanks for the answers. And I have a, a, a methodology question related to the evaluation. So I, I said those are like micro kernels and that were hand tuned. So I guess uh, there is no compiler or or smart library to do the conversion and then use the operations that Tracer uh, provides. So uh, they were like written and optimized by 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 you guys. Uh, is is that true? Uh, Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, so okay. There's no compiler yet. And as I mentioned at the end of the talk, compilation is one of the big challenges left. Yeah, and then that will lead my next question. I guess I'm going to it for the end of the talk to to get to that point of like the other challenges that processing using memory needs to to solve yes. before being completely uh, applicable would be like oh what's the challenge of doing compiler? <laughs> exactly, but exactly. I'm going to save that question for for later on. And uh, my last question is related to uh, if you are thinking about actually or talking with uh, some of your collaborators because you said that your collaborators some of them are from the device. Uh, this device uh, aspect of, of, of the research or, or work on device, uh, uh, device. I don't know if they do manufacturing, but uh, prototyping or something. But mm -hmm. are in the talks of uh, uh, actually the, uh, creating this, uh, creating a real uh, architecture based on Racer or, uh, or, and do you think that would be feasible uh, as in the architecture that you propose? And I ask this because one of your main motivations before uh, was the the practicality of you need to be conscious about what can be done um, in terms of architecture, what can be done in terms of uh, manufacturing for the architecture that we actually are proposing. And mm -hmm. since uh, you, you you were mindful on 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 that aspect when you uh, design racer, I'm questioning like yeah, what would that be our next step of actually in the in the in the, in the lower level the step would be the next step to develop. Yeah. Develop. Well, so I'm actually talking next about some of the, the no, and I'll go through quickly in the interest of time since uh, you know, I think we're at 11, no, 11, 10 already in my side. Um, um, and I want to make sure I leave time for more questions, but um, we've done some other like device level work to actually see how we can take the lessons from Racer and push them towards you know, the OSCO, which we're going to talk about in a second. Uh, a goal of ours, certainly in this project, is to be able to fabricate this. Um, uh, it's an open question how large of a race report that we can actually fabricate, right? Because, you know, until we get industrial partners who you know if there are any that are here and they want to help us, certainly, like we'd love to be able to play with your, you know, re-ramp technologies. It's difficult to be able to make large scale arrays in nanofabs, right? Okay. We can get to some arrays, we can test some of the basic concepts of racer and we think that that's probably going to be a first step to understand you know, how this all integrates. But in reality, yeah, we'd like to have chips that may not have the full eight gigabytes, but they can reasonably get like, you know, multiple megabytes with the data on here so that we can start exploring you know, uh, full device behavior, right? Because parasitics and spice simulations are great. They're still not 100% ideal, right? And that will have a lot of implications on how how we deal with things such as variability. We did design, you know, um, you know our sense amps to sustain things like the variability within RAM cells. Uh, one of the issues that they have is that you can write a one to the same cell three different times and it will actually have three different resistance values in the end. Um, we actually were conscious about designing, you know, flexible sense amps that could um, help amortize that. Um, there are other things towards adoption that I'll talk about later on that are essential here. Um, but yeah, short answer is we want to fabricate. There are things that we are conscious of that still need to be done, but it is a long-term goal. I see, I see. So I guess those are my questions. Thanks so much, Sagata. I don't know if the room has more questions. Uh, Adi has a question. Hey, Sagata. Um, so this is a little, I mean, I, I would really appreciate your help on clearing a doubt that I have. 
Sure. So, so this work is based on uh, Kavinsky's work, Magic. Is that correct? Yes. Perfect. So, um, one problem that I I was not very sure about is that when you're using Magic, you assume that the cells are written in each cycle, right? When you're operating on those cells, the input of voltage, I mean, one input is the voltage and the other input is the value in the cell. So how can, and both of these operations have very, very different, let's say timings or a lot of performance metrics. So mm -hmm. I, I, was, I was not very sure, like, is, is that factored in? Like, and second would be that these cells can't really be rearranged as in like the operation that we intend to achieve with these cells is sort of dependent on the configuration. By configuration, I mean the architecture or micro, I, I don't know what's the right word, but basically the connections between cells dictate the operation that we get at the end. So do we combine cells to achieve more complex operations or is there something? Oh. So with the quick answer to your first question, Adi, is yes, we actually did take all of that into account in terms of the, you know, uh, the latencies, the, the variation of the signals, the spread of the signals, all of that to make magic as sustainable and scalable as possible. We are gonna talk a little bit more about that actually in the next section I have here. Um, but because there are things that magic is, you know, has shortcomings on, we've been able to work around them with the new logic family that we designed. Um, the, on the second front, uh, for the ISA, the one thing I want to point out here is that, um, you know, the reason we're presenting this ISA and not the NOR operations is that we want to abstract away some of that low level behavior, all right? The way the ISA is designed, I don't need to be cognizant of of, you know, like I need to be cognizant of the fact that my operation, you know, like where my operation is located right now, that's one of the downsides of hand compiling. But I can pull data from any one corner of the chip to any other corner of the chip, thanks to the, that, um, that mesh network that we have on top of the clusters, All right? So right now as a programmer, it, yes, you have to think about if my one piece of data is in this, file cluster and one piece data in this cluster, I need to use the IO network to move it over before I can do the operation. And that is a shortcoming of the, you know, the vector ISO that we expose right now, um, which we're hoping with higher level tools, we'll be able to amortize, so actually hide away. But other than that, we are trying to hide the intrinsics of exactly what's next to each other with this ISA. So it does give us one level away from actually having to know specifics about the architecture. You just need to know the capacities of the cores at this point. And I didn't show here, but everything in the cores, we essentially treat as vector registers. So they're assigned their own unique vector register numbers and everything you're doing here is essentially, you know, assigning vector register ops. And based on those registers and their locations, you know, when they're down compiled to the normal micro ops, I should say down assemble, uh, assemble down, I guess. Um, um, those are um, like those will take into account the data movement that's necessary. So I don't know if that fully answers your question, Adi, but yeah, that sounds great. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Uh, I have another question. Yeah, sure. Hi. What's up? And uh, when doing like a um, palm, the most important thing for me is like the endurance of the OVM. When we, when we use the OVM to do the processing using memory. And yes. uh, you, should, you need to, every time you do the computation, you need to do, you need to write the data back to the uh, RM here. And uh, not only the endurance, also the uh, write energy of RM is really high. And how do you like uh, um, solve this problem when you design the RM based problem? Absolutely. So, you know, one thing I can show you here is that, um, you know, we, we put this table together actually show a comparison between what commercial technologies are capable of today in the today column, oh, sorry, um, over here. And then what we believe is achievable with scaling in, in the relatively near future. Okay? Um, and yeah, right energy is currently a fairly high barrier in existing devices, but there are already prototypes in literature that can bring this down significantly. 
because in fact, it's a function of the on state to the right voltage in the right period. Um, the thing that seems to be the most difficult to push with in terms of device scalability is likely going to be that uh, right voltage, bring it down from two volts to one volt. So even if we don't assume that, right? Um, you know, we still have healthy gains that are that seem like they're well within reach for the right period and the um, the uh, ratio of on state versus off state for the resistors, to the point where you know right now we're assuming two femtojoules per right is feasible. But even if we don't push on these, you know, it's not infeasible to get maybe like eight femtojoules per right. And so using very coarse pessimistic numbers that takes us down from 189x energy gain to let's say 45, 50x, right? So essentially, yeah, we, we think that, you know, if the technologies that make it, there are gonna be some sacrifices we have, but we have enough of a margin and the rest of it seems like it's possible to get to that we can still reasonably like have large energy savings with this, you know, with this type of approach after the fact. I see. The question is exactly how much, and that's a big unknown, right? That's gonna depend on how the technology matures over the next few years. As far as endurance, I keep, I apologize, I keep forgetting to add in this slide. It's in our paper. We have a section that discusses this. Um, today, people can, at small scales, fabricate DRAM devices that are capable of 10 to the 12 writes uh, as a lifetime. Yeah. So, um, for, for the uh, like uh, frequently updates, because the. Oh, so here, let, let me tell you. So, we, we did a study with Racer to look at the, our applications and see. What it would take to run Racer 24 7 for 10 years. Right. And we found that the total number of writes in our architecture was 7. Point, I think 7 times 10 to the 13. So we're within 10, uh, two orders of magnitude of what these existing devices are capable of without thinking of future advances that we see. So while we're not quite there yet, we're actually closer than we think. Right. By the way, do you, do you consider any um, variations inside the uh, memory cells? Yes, I mentioned this when uh, Geraldo asked, but um, we consider variations of the memory cells, and that's actually part of our model that we look at. We consider the variations of writes, um, and we design our sense amplifiers to be able to be resistant to all of that. Um, one of the approaches we have, which I forget if we talk about in our micro paper or in our jetcast paper, which I'm going to talk about next, um, although I might need to do a quick time check first with everybody. Um, is that we have the ability to um, shift the sense amplifiers if need be, if there's cases of high variability. Okay. So we can do a little bit of bias and tell us out there. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. Any other questions? Sagata, I have a question here in Zoom. Sure. Um, the wire uh, issue that you mentioned that motivates later on this is smaller tiles. Yeah, uh, what, what is the uh, circuit level or like device level outlook into addressing that issue and enabling larger tiles? For example, how would dimensioning the wire, let's say increase against the diameter, uh, affect uh, its limitations? And in general, how, how is, let's say, the future outlook in these lower levels? So there's actually two questions I can mention there. Right? Like the first is the dimension of the wire, right? Like we always make fatter wires, right? And try to reduce the, you know, the amount of current that's going there. But it's actually not the easiest of propositions, right? Because then we're, we're eating up density, we're introducing more parasitics and you know, resistance and capacitance for the wire itself. Um, there are a whole bunch of factors that come into play, right? So what we found from a quick look was that, um, there's maybe some variation, but we're roughly within the same ballpark in terms of order of magnitude. So that, um, you know, simply just changing the design of our existing wires won't make a difference. The next thing is what's the outlook from technology? And, you know, maybe this is something that's worth looking into, but, you know, right now, metal wires are a fairly well-trodden technology, right? We, I don't, it's not something I have a huge area of expertise on, but my understanding in talking with others is that no one's looking at disruptive, you know, metal technologies. Now you could maybe look at carbon nanotubes and look at, you know, how that can alleviate some of this, but that would introduce a whole slew of other design and integration issues that we aren't looking at right now, right? And maybe in the future that can help us overcome some of these kinds of things. But for now, um, it doesn't seem like there are advances on, on the metal deposition front that will significantly change the uh, current capacity properties because it's not the actual device itself, right? It's, the, it's just the wire. Cool, thank you. Sure.
Are there other questions? Just so that I have another question. Like, uh, sure. I'm not very familiar with the computational model that you are using in, inside the, your device. Mm -hmm. So I understand that initially you have to move all your input data to the memory, and then you use the memory also to actually, uh, like, move. No, like from this input, you are creating outputs that they are also being stored in the memory. And this is in my head, in my head at least, it is like a like a data flow that it's moving and using also like memory positions to store intermediate data, the output. And then if you want to have another operation that uses this output, you have to find another location to move that data to and like traverse like the memory. So my question is regarding uh, how efficient is then like from the perspective of how much of the, the your input data, how, how much space is occupied for by your input data and how much space you have to leave Yes. Available so that you can move data inside. Ah, that's an excellent question, David. I have or I had, I think. Um, uh, if, if you see the slide on the bottom, we actually broke down uh, this a bit in our um, uh, in our study of uh, in our jetcast paper, what I'm about to talk about next. Right. You can see that actually differs wildly from benchmark to benchmark, right? Mm -hmm. It also differs on the type of operations that you can do in your memories. For example, magic can only do NORs. Felix is a technology that can support not uh, uh, NORs, NANs, and uh, ORs, I believe. I have it on the website. I can you know, go back and confirm. But it's actually three logic primitives, so it actually reduces the number of intermediates that you need. Right. But what you can see is for some of these you know, applications, you know, we're not using a ton of space for the inputs or outputs or intermediates. For some of them, we're using a fairly healthy amount of space. Mm -hmm. It's really application dependent. And I'd argue this is actually one of the places where you need tools to make, you know, to figure this out because it is a difficult problem to do, right? You no, know, yeah, exactly. I, I was thinking like this is what this was setting up like an optimization problem, not that the probably Absolutely. you have like yeah, found a good solution for the moment, but uh, there is room for improvement that right. A hundred percent, right? And you know that's actually one of the things we're looking at is how we can, how we can automate a lot of that and actually be able to make this more efficient because it is, you know, it, it's something that you no know, an expert can do by hand, and, and you know even with the vector I say you need to think about this kind of stuff, and in the long term that's not feasible, right? For large problems it's just not doable. And so, um, yeah. so yes, uh, it's something on our radar. It is one of the what I would big challenges that needs to be solved for this, but. Uh, no, we don't have a full solution for it just yet. Yeah, I, I see like, like for instance, in the Linet, I was surprised that the, in your speed up, Linet was not doing so great. And I see that you are using most of the input, not for storage. It, is there a correlation between the speed up and the fact that probably you don't have space there or you were forced to like parallelize a lot this? That's actually a good question about the input. I don't know if you looked at the input side of it, but we do know that Linet, uh, well, no, um, some of it suffered from a bit of the sparsity that Lynette has, right? Like Lynette isn't just dense matrices. And so mm -hmm. um, well, one thing that we find is that, and we, in the second paper, we have some ways to prove it, um, but density is kind of the Achilles heel. These are, you know, sort of brute force bulk computing architectures, right? Anytime you introduce sparsity, you are doing empty operations and that's reducing your throughput, right? And that can come at a cost for something that's highly optimized to pack in all of the sparse data and extract things. You know, at a at a single operand level, right? Yeah. Um, so that's part of the problem that's here. Um, and yeah, we found ways to you know reduce the the performance um, degradation of the net. Um, but uh, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, time check pending. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, it's it's one of those things where there's still work to do. And ultimately, if your sparsity is so high, it's unclear if this in its current form is the right approach or if you think about how to enable better control for sparsity. You think that there are ways where you can not have to do bulk operations and vector operations every time, but what the additional control circuitry for that is and the program interface, that's one of the areas that we're looking into right now. I understand. So I'm just like a comment. So like, uh, I see like, uh, like these solutions that we're proposing now are just like, a, probably paving the, the road no, for like a wider applicability of these uh, architectures. But right. for me, like one of the big limitations I see is that we need like embarrassingly, like um, embarrassing amounts of uh, operation level parallelism no, that we can use. And in order to like, because you are creating 
like a bit serial at the beginning, then you are using pipelining, and then you are using like replicating this like uh, many times in order to in the end get the throughput, right? So as a result of that, then the the coverage of applications no, that could benefit from such architecture diminishes. So it would be. So, so I'd actually argue that like, you know, the things that we're looking at are not, you no, know, at least not what I conventionally call embarrassingly parallel. Yes, you need some sort of data parallelism, but it falls somewhere between, you know, embarrassingly parallel and, and it's certainly more than like what like ILP can give you on a conventional core. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not at the scale that, you know, you'd argue that you need embarrassingly parallel operations either, right? If you look back at some of the operation that we're doing, they're not bit serial um, because of the way we do them. And because of that, they're actually, you know, um, they're actually not efficiently doing that kind of pipelining and parallelism. Like any of our non-bits pipeline operations, you know, they are capable of doing them and getting reasonable throughputs on them, but it, um, it requires a bit more complexity and um, precision in the control flow, right? Mm -hmm. So we can yeah. do that in ways that doesn't require full and parallelism. And we can do that independently for tile, right? Nothing about this is, you know, like, like if you look at things like Ambit and uh, CindyRAM, for example, right? We're looking at 2,000 operands in parallel at once, right? Mm -hmm. Nothing, but for, but for here, we're looking at 64 operands in parallel, and then everything else can be independent instruction. So there's a need for that kind of independent parallelism right now. Um, mm -hmm. But it's not like our results are also feeding the tiles nonstop either. We are actually taking dependencies and you know, uh, warm up and you know, cool downs of the pipelines into account, and those are practical things that real applications will deal with. Okay, because I was imagining, like for instance, the Linet, you you had to use probably a very huge batch size, no? In order that that's why you have such a big input, no? Uh, I don't think we have to change the batch size uh, from you know all, all that much um, because we. Uh, you know, if we made it too large, then we'd have issues on the other platforms, right? So um, mm -hmm. I'd have to go back and check with my student, but I believe the batch sizes we kept were consistent across the uh, different platforms. Okay, then I misread that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I was imagining like, uh, because it's also interesting to be able to do like also like for these machine learning applications on, at the edge, no? You you don't want yeah. to have, to, to, to need to wait for such like large batch, batch sizes and you're interested in like short latencies as well. Sure, and that could be a way to overcome some of the limitations that we're seeing with Linux right now. But um, we thought that would be perhaps a little bit unfair to like, you know, overly cater the problem to, you know, um, to our platform. So uh, as best as we could, all the parameters for the for the microkernels we kept were consistent across all the devices. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks a lot. Sure, um, Geraldo. Yes, we are running out of time. Yes, I know pizza is supposed to come in a minute. <laughs> Um, okay. And it's been great because we had a lot of questions, but I guess the question is, you know, would it be better for me to shortcut a little bit, or? I think, I think, uh, I don't know how is your or time for you over there. Uh, I guess maybe we can uh, shortcut a little bit the presentation uh, if you have to leave early, uh, not early, they are the best at time. But if you have um, uh, to leave, maybe we need to conclude with the, with the, or, Give us some summary of the other work and conclude. So I, I have some time. I want to make sure that I don't deprive people of food, and I want to make sure that I don't, um, you know, um, um, by dishonors uh, comments. And so yep. yes, I can keep going. So why don't I try to like you know wrap up maybe in the next like uh, mm -hmm. 15 minutes, and then maybe use that as okay. comments. We can wait over here. It's fine. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I believe, believe me. I will try to keep more than necessary between you and your food. Okay. <laughs> so thank you so much for that. Um, cool. So I'm going to move on, and then maybe I'll, I'll hold questions until the end if that works for everybody. Um, so Racer essentially said, "Hey, let's talk to the devices, folks. Let's figure out what architects are doing wrong, and let's try to think about how we can design an architecture that caters to the things that the devices do." What we did then was complete the loop, right? Um, as Adi mentioned before, you know, there's this the the, the Magic family was what we did our initial studies on. Um, and that has its own limitations. But the architecture about racer, think about it, the tiles, the pipelining, there's nothing that's specific to a logic family or a specific way of using voltages. It's simply an architecture where we can support one of many different types of logic families and one of many different types of, you know, like we don't have to use one S, one R, as I mentioned, we can support one T, one R. And so 
in a follow-on work where we looked at this in, in JetCast uh, you know, this year, we actually published this a few months ago. Um, and by the way, for anyone who's looking for the links, they're available on the, the talk page and I believe on the uh, YouTube uh, live stream. But we wanted to understand, you know, what are some of the limitations that magic poses and other logic families pose? And are they actually things that we can use for real devices? Okay. Uh, and so remember before I was talking about that you know, non-linearity, this is sort of a, you know, a highly abstracted version. You'd imagine it's a little bit of smoothest this curve, but this is essentially the reaction that happens from here when you're setting a voltage, uh, sorry, setting a cell um, to a, you know, a high resistance state, or you're resetting a cell to a low resistance state. And essentially this very non-linear type of behavior that exists. Um, and this is the source of a lot of problems. One of the things that um, we, we focus on here is essentially the switching constraints and the ratios between them, because that actually, you know, that's dictated by the properties of the device itself. Um, and I'm not gonna go into the instance of time, but you can see some of the different ratios that exist between the, uh, um, the uh, voltage that we apply for inputs and the voltage drop that occurs over the outputs for different input values. Um, and essentially what we're trying to do is make sure that um, you know, anything above a half of, you know, um, if you're using one volt as a starting point, that anything over half a volt will switch in the right cases. Um, and so this is actually the, the ratio of the input voltage allows us to choose whether or not we're doing, for example, an OR operation or an AND operation. Um, and there are a number of different logic families that build upon this. So Magic is one of them. Felix is another one that was published uh, by Tiana Rosen's group at uh, UCSD in 2018. Um, but the bottom line, to make this a little bit simpler, we tried to plot the constraints and how they affect devices in this three-dimensional plot. So there's three voltages we're concerned about. The setting voltage to set the cell to a um, high resistance state, the resetting voltage to reset a cell to a low resistance state, and then the voltage that's being applied for the logic itself, what we can actually provide to make the logical operations happen. And on the x-axis, I'm showing one of the two ratios. On the y-axis, I'm showing the other ratio. And magic has this constraint that's shown up here. So if I visualize that, we see that magic and Felix fall in this upper left-hand corner of this, um, of this graph. The question is, can devices that we can build today actually have ratios for set and reset that fall within this boundary. And unfortunately, it turns out that that's not the case. Um, in real voltages today, typically what we're getting is that um, the uh, set voltage has to be less than half of the reset the voltage. Okay. And so unfortunately, this means that while magic is a cute idea that maybe with nanofab devices we can do, with the typical devices that you can fab in, in you know, like prototype commercial processes, it's not really gonna work very well. And so we started to design a logic family that could actually work within the constraints of typical devices. Um, and I'm not going to go into the details of it. There's a lot more information on our JetCast paper. We actually looked at you know, how to um, you know, balance the voltage division to allow us to get into this uh, range. And we came up with a new logic family that we call OSPR that can do NOR operations that are non-destructive. Um, and Oscar Noor actually is compatible with many of the typical devices that you can build. And we also came up with a destructive OR operation that you know, has compatible with a bunch of other typical devices. And so unlike Magic and Felix, we're actually starting to get to the range of what typical devices can do and covering many of them in a way that can still do the type of logic that we're looking to you know, explore. Uh, in this work, we also looked a bit at you know, how to take the decode and drive units of our architecture, which were admittedly designed for uh, magic. So everything about the architecture is generally architecture not, uh, uh, device agnostic, except for these decode and drive units that are setting the voltages that actually perform the operations. You can imagine that those voltages are very specific to the technology and to the logic family that we're implementing. And so I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but we came up with a clever way to be able to essentially have uh, various voltage buses hooked up to decoders that could allow us to drive multiple vo voltages and amortize this, such that we could take the architecture and you know, build decode and drive units um, that are fairly robust 
and that can be biased for the specific voltages of the technology that we're using. And quickly, we looked at 1T1R as well, and we found that we could apply RACER to 1T1R. Um, it's nice because unlike the 1S1R technologies, which are you know, better for density, they are also um, less of a proven technology for selecting the switches. Um, replacing the selector material with an actual transistor is much more robust. Um, the downside though, is that you know, we use back into line integration as we're laying out the chip. And these, the transistors for the selectors need to pop up across multiple metal layers. And so they reduce the density that we can achieve with racer. Um, it reduces density. Um, there's some extra energy that's used for the uh, transistors themselves. In total, it drops the active pipeline count by about 24%. Um, and what we found was that you know, we did a study looking at MAGIC. So MAGIC, I talked about MAGIC and it being capable of NOR. It's also capable of NAND operations using the same concepts. Um, we look at Felix, which I apologize, I got this wrong, supports NAND, NOR, and OR. And we looked at Oscar, our new family that supports NOR and OR operations. What we did was we rewrote the, uh, our micro benchmarks to be optimized for each of these logic families. And so the baseline, magic NOR, is what I was showing you, the 107x speed up and 189x energy savings from before. Building on top of that, uh, what we find is that you know, the benefits are you know, can be much higher depending on the technologies um, but Oscar, which is, can work with practical devices, also increases the performance by 30% versus Magic Nor. So that 107x went up another 30%, right? So like 140x. I have a question in slot here. That I don't know if you're going to, if I cut you, sorry, if that's the case. No, go ahead and draw it. Uh, you're going to talk about, uh, is FedEx uh, showing more speed up? I know that like it's not in the area that it's feasible to implement. So that is, of course, one drawback. But that is like it's providing more speed up because it requires less uh, uh, number of uh, operations to do a particular exactly. operation. Exactly. It's similar to SIMD, right? Like, you know, you could do one operation to get some benefits if it's a universal operator, but the more operations you have, the fewer instruction, the fewer micro ops you need, right? Okay. So that improves your throughput. That also reduces the storage density. So there, there's benefits that come from multiple dimensions for that. Yeah. yeah. Right. Thank you. Um, so yeah, that, that's why Felix performs better. But yeah, as, as you mentioned, it's actually not, it doesn't solve the fabrication problem that uh, we have with Magic. But with Oscar, we're getting that along with increased performance and energy savings. So you know, um, the energy savings grow by 37%. So that takes us from 189X to um, you know, somewhere in the mid 200s, I think. Or, or actually upper 200s, I guess, somewhere around that range. And quickly, you know, because we, we want to compare this to machine learning accelerators, right? So we looked at Cascade. Cascade is a state-of-the-art research, um, you know, reram-based accelerator that looks at analog multi-cell, uh, multi-level cell neural network multiplies. Cascade already showed an order of magnitude of improvements over our conventional array-based CMOS neural network accelerators. They compared against Dadian uh, uh, now in their, um, in their work. Um, uh, so it might not quite be at the level of like modern TPUs or neural engines and things like that, but Cascade already compared to that and uh, showed a, um, an over an order of magnitude throughput and an order of magnitude energy improvement over that. Compared to Cascade, after our optimizations, we actually see healthy improvements. Um, so I see Adi's not here, but I actually come back to his question from earlier. Sorry, not, uh, not Adi, but uh, David had this question before about the net and why it performs so poorly. Um, here, um, we actually were able to be competitive with Lynette because we came up with a new way of doing the matrix multiply operations um, that was more throughput oriented in Racer. Um, and so we sacrificed some of the energy improvements there, but we were able to actually close most of the gap that we had with Lynette's. Um, in the past with our, you know, a combination of Oscar and our smarter uh, matrix multiply operation. And so we're actually not only like, you know, competitive and outperforming Cascade, which is dedicated for neural networks, but we can do all sorts of things that Cascade can't because we're supporting a much wider array of operations beyond just matrix multiply. So right, we have, average, we have a on YouTube that I think yeah. is appropriate talk of time to to make uh, the question, I guess, is more general, not necessarily about any of those books. But uh, 
uh, and what I understood from the question is that uh, we we made a, a lot of effort as a like a, as a community or like a manufacturers to move from AC to DC because of the benefit that DC computation base uh, provides. And now you are introducing again analogic computation to multi I don't know something like multiple matrix multiplication as in cascade, for example, right? So I guess he's asking here. Uh, especially this difference of moving back to analog computation now in those type of uh, processing using memory, or also I don't know cascade so well. I don't know if it's a, I don't, it's not a processing using memory accelerator, right? Uh, it, it's what I would consider processing using memory accelerator. Cascade is essentially you know, actually doing the compute by turning on two um, two cells at once and doing a matrix multiply by you know, essentially using Kirchhoff's current law. Okay, okay. So yeah, so basically it's, it's, it's a comment about uh, moving from DC to AC in those setups. And you think it's, it's I think it's just for you to comment out uh, how you see Sure, and, and so what I will say is that no, we're, we're not fully analog either in this sense. Yes, we're turning on two cells at once and getting an operation, right? But um, that's, you know, in one respect, is that any different than turning on two transistors and a gate once to get a combined voltage? Yeah. Right? At the end, we have the same properties, right? Uh, we're no, we're we're there's some differences. Like we're not fully restoring voltages, but we're mostly restoring them. We're only looking at highs and lows, so we're not looking at multi-bit operations and anything that Racer does, right? Um, yes, the domain is different. It's not your typical voltage-based domain, but you know there's been a lot of momentum on these analog, sorry, not analog, these uh, emerging memories, um, and they all have this property. You know, all of these new memories, including Intel's Optane, which was actually made for several years are some form of a broader class of resistive memory, right? Not specifically VRAM, but resistive memories. And they all have the same thing. Resistance, uh, like IO is done in the current domain, right? And we have to do some sort of conversion out when we're, um, you know, when we're, we're done. Uh, for better or worse, this is you know, one of the promising paths to avoid the VRAM scaling issues that we've been dealing with for a long time, right? And while it's still, you know, I mean, I, I always say this, you know, everyone said it's five years out and they've been saying that for like 10, 12 years. But we're finally at the precipice where most companies, you know, so most of these memory technologies have at least a couple of companies that have uh, demoed prototype chips of them now. So we're finally at the cusp of this being a reality. And so I think, yeah, it is a little bit of a change. Yes, it requires to think differently, but, you know, and maybe this is a place where in SRM computation can still marry the best of both worlds if you're willing to take the density hit. Um, but these memories are likely coming, you know, at some point, right? Intel's, you know, premature death with Optane is probably not the last time we're going to see any kind of emerging memory, because we need to you know DRAM is fundamentally running out of steam. Uh, and so, you know, if we're already going to be doing this to access our I/O, <clears throat> I'd argue that it's really not terribly cumbersome to do some computation in there as well. Right? We're not fundamentally changing the properties of it to make it you know, like 10x less reliable or anything just to do that computation. Thanks a lot for that, I totally agree. I think it really answered the question, thanks so much. Cool. So, um, like I said, I'll save other questions until the end if uh, you guys are okay with that. But real quick, I kind of want to tie up, you know, where we go from here. So this is all like, you know, sounds great, right? Huge speed ups, like multiple amazing things. You know, if you, if you want to like, you know, tout like numbers and stuff like that. But let's be practical. Why aren't we doing this now? In fact, I'd argue this actually comes up a little bit to a high use question, like you know, edge devices that can use POM can introduce new forms of data analytics that we've never really thought about before. Okay? In the past, we we could do inference, and we've often been trying to do what a lot of people in industry have been doing, which is overloading machine learning networks to do all sorts of computation and like you know, relying on inference to be good enough. But you can do a lot more things with Racer. For example, I can take time series samples of data, record them, and then periodically run an analytics routine over them in bulk processing to figure out, you know, let's say if there is any errors or anomalies that are detected, right? So instead of having to communicate back, you know, let's say data in a farm about the condition of crops every, you know, every sensor reading, right? Right now, maybe I feed some of that to the AI model and then I send a bunch of data back to the cloud to do the second level processing after the inference is done. I could do a lot of that computation locally as well. And therefore I could you know, avoid sending that huge amount of data, right? You know, that could be megabytes or gigabytes worth of you know, raw or only semi-processed data going across a wireless network. 
If I can bring that back on chip, I can drastically cut the network energy, which is one of the largest components of edge device usage today, that we only need to use it much more sparingly. And if we combine that with the non-volatility, we can even use this for things like intermittent compute. Um, you know, people have been looking at energy harvesting systems and how you can bring down energy consumption by orders of magnitude to do things in the field. And there are a number of different use cases that I think something like this could enable um, if you can fill out the rest of the ecosystem. And coming back to the other part of Heidi's question, there's the data processing in the cloud. We think that this is a great place, much like what, um, um, what Catapult did for FPGAs, for those of you that are familiar, right? You know, cloud computing has multiple tenants, all sorts of people that are running workloads, and it's near impossible to put dedicated accelerators there for each of the different problems that people are solving. But one of the big powers of Catapult is that we have throw reconfigurable hardware and we can get many of the benefits of the ASICs, but have them for everybody because you can simply reconfigure, you can have multiple you know, pieces of logic running on the same, uh, on the same chip. Um, you can essentially cater to the demands of the cloud and offer flexibility and hardware acceleration in ways that you could not do um, with ASICs because it's just cost prohibitive and uh, labor intensive to keep swapping them in and out. You can imagine that a PUM chip such as Racer, which supports a whole slew of operations that go well beyond machine learning, could help accelerate many of these data intensive applications or across a wide range of these data you know, uh, operands that we do. And it's reconfigurable. I can just send different commands. I can partition off different parts of the chip to be able to do different you know, workloads. And so this whole idea of you know, trying to address data movement in the cloud, it's a big issue and we can do it without having to be doing specific in ways that fundamentally would otherwise tie our hands towards helping the cloud. So I think there are opportunities like this at large scales where something like Palm can actually be of, of benefit as well. So the big question is if I'm selling this great snake oil story, why aren't we building these computers today? Well, um, it's some of this comes back to the lifetime, right? We talked about the voltages, you know, and the voltages do need to come down, but that's not essential as I showed you uh, in one of my earlier slides. Even though I think a lot of, you know, when we talk to some devices folks that have not been looking at the architectures, they're often obsessed with reducing the voltages and the currents of these devices. We really don't need those to come down as much as we need to improve the on-off ratios of the devices and as much as we need to improve the reliability and device lifetimes. So I think there's some stuff where we can hopefully working together, give device um, physicists and material scientists sort of our laundry list of what we want to see uh, to make these architectures viable. Um, essentially, we need to close the loop between the cool device that they're building that can do an OR, and how do you make this at scale for problems that people are actually going to use these architectures for, right? Um, I already talked about the digital pump limitations and the crossbar size, um, and I talked about the analog pump limitations about the precision that's difficult to achieve in these types of you know, um, you know, non-linear devices. And even if we look at you know the hardware of like DRAM and SRAM, we have some other issues that we have to that we contend with, right? I talked about Ambit and SIM DRAM and how you know right now it's difficult to chop them up below vectors that are often thousands of uh, devices wide. Or even if you do that, you need transpose units to be able to rearrange the data for for it to work with DRAM. SRAM, you know, we have low densities; they're just not at the scale of uh, main memory, and so you can't use these chips as main memory. So uh, like for example, Racer can be used equally as a main memory as well as a POM architecture. So you don't have to move data simply to do the accelerated computation. But in SRAM, we still have to swap out between the main memory and the CPU and the upper levels of the cache just because we're, if you're using it as a cache, it's only got so much area that we can dedicate to it. Um, and I had touched on some of these problems before, but we need to start thinking as architects about well, what are circuit and wiring overheads of distributing instruction? How do we get stuff to the arrays? Yeah, sure, we can hand tune them, but there's gotta be a binary. The binary has gotta be sourced. We've gotta make sure that it's scalable in, in ways that can actually achieve the potential million way parallelism that an, a, a pump substrate can unlock. And we need to think about things such as branches and divergence and how we actually support you know, proper control flow um, in ways that our programs have been accustomed to using for decades. Um, that needs, you know, the divergence in particular needs hardware solutions as well as software solutions, but hardware is going to be, uh, have to be a large part of that story there. But even if you solve the devices and the architecture, there's still a need for a full stack. 
And part of the problem I'd argue for this full stack is that we don't know which of them devices is going to win. So nobody wants to sit here and write software for the architecture that might lose, right? Um, we don't know what a primitive is going to use. We don't know what underlying microarchitecture is going to have. But this is nothing new, right? We solved this in 1964 with ISAs. And we can do this again. And I argue we're finally at a point of critical mass where we want to move forward and we want to build that full stack. We now need to think more than ever of a universal PIM ISA that can be applied across all of these different architectures. And that, with that, then we need to think about what we can do for programmers, right? Which means developing programming models for PIM. And I'd argue that if we want the transition to work, we want people to bite and use the technology. We simply can't just have them learn a new programming model. That's how, unfortunately, a lot of new hardware technologies come out with a lot of promise and then die early. It's the infant mortality problem. Having people learn new programming models is inherently difficult because it limits the, you know, very quickly the, the number of people that can adopt to it. If instead we can take existing uh, programming models people are used to and adapt them for PIM, we have a much greater chance of success. Things that are very popular people are using. There are lots of data parallel programming models that people use all the time for multi-threaded applications. It would be much better for us to use those and to provide support for mechanisms such as shared memory or you know, cache coherence and things that people are used to so that we don't completely alienate them with a new piece of hardware that might have great benefits, but isn't worth, you know, the, the, the uncertainty isn't worth the amount of time spent on learning how to program it and catering everything you do to a specific you know, new technology. We also need support not only for compilers that can automatically identify opportunities for PIM and generate binaries that either move everything to PIM or split work between PIM and the CPU. We also need support to partition data across the cores, right? We talked right now about in races, you've got to move data back and forth, and it's actually very, you know, it's actually very difficult because um, right now you, know, you need to know where your, you know, which array your data is in, and if your data is sitting in a far, you know far a cluster from another uh, piece of data, and that's true for all of your data. You know, you're spending most of your you know, operations moving data into the right tiles. Ideally, we want software to help us with this so that the data is, you know, as much of the data is local to the tile for when we need it. Um, we're actually looking at, you know, problems like this and actually trying to solve them. And we think we have some traction on them, um, but it really requires the full ecosystem. And we're working as architects now to come up with a lot of these things, but we're certainly, hoping that the systems community and the you know, compilers community will come along and explore this stuff because you know, we need that cooperation, just like we have for Racer going down the stack, we need the cooperation up the stack to make this stuff happen. And once we know how to write programs, we need to think about OSs and runtimes. We need to think about multi-tenancy to support things like cloud computing um, acceleration. And that includes one of the problems that we've long punted for PIM, which is memory virtualization. So I'd argue it's a really exciting time but we need to, as architects, get out of our comfort zone and actually start looking across the stack in ways that we never have before to really make all of this stuff possible. And so with that, you know, I just want to leave you with the fact that you know, PIM and PUM in particular has a lot of promise. You know, I gave you an example with Racer. And while I'd love it to be at Racer is not the end-all be-all architecture, but it shows that even doing some work across the stack, there is a potential for not only solving a lot of practical problems, but getting large benefits at the same time. And so I'd argue that if you're going to work in this domain, start reaching out across these boundaries. It takes time. It took us four years to start having conversations that made sense between the devices folks and the architecture folks, and then get to the point we are now with Racer and being open design stuff. And the, you know, the first year or so of just learning how to speak each other's language actually paid off significantly now. Um, but I think it's a price that if you're willing to pay, you can get a lot of dividends out of it. And so I think, you know, we need to really think about co-improving stuff going down the stack. And we need to start thinking about the software stack and working across that domain as well. Um, and again, if you're interested in more, learning more about Racer, we've got a Micro 2021 paper and a Jetcast 2022 paper talking about the various things I've touched on today in more detail. Um, with that, I just want to thank, you know, my collaborators on these particular works um, uh, that we've been looking at. And uh, with that, uh, thank you very much. And I'm happy to take any questions or let you go for uh, pizza. <laughs> Thanks so much, Sugata. I actually have a, a small question related to oh. the challenge that uh, you were talking about, about adopting proxy memory and operating system. 
So uh, I remember I, I remember that there was a paper from I think Hot Hot OS 2017 uh, called uh, "It's Time to Think About Operating System for Any Data Processing Architecture" with a position paper. So this had five years, and you still don't have a like a processing memory operating system for processing memory. And I can I can point point like also other problems in the stack, uh, like as well no coherence, for example. Is, is a huge problem and data, data partition is a huge problem for processing memory, uh, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. depends on the type of thing that you go. And it's still there in the literature, there are really compared to amount of ping accelerators for machine learning and coherence papers from processing memory, or comparing one literature uh, for one and the other is even unfair. Like you have thousands of papers from accelerating your paper workload in ping and yeah. no, five papers for coherence of uh, processing sure. memory. <laughs> So what, what do you think is taking us so long to go and fix those problems? Do you think it's just because they are fundamentally hard and like we we are avoiding them or is, is there a lack of a mature enough uh, uh, processing memory architecture, a more concrete processing memory architecture that can focus on, on a particular device and then focus our efforts in that particular uh, uh, technology? I think it's a little bit of both, right? For example, you know, some of the work that um, you know we did in Safari with uh, Amar Ali looked at cache coherence for effectively processing near memory, but you know, in the context of PIM, right? Um, that work took quite a long time to get together because there was a lack of infrastructure at the time, and you know, there was not a lot of certainty in terms of what those architectures would look like, right? And you know, that was a long labor of love to be able to get that work out. Um, we're in a different place now because there is at least an infrastructure, right? Um, you know, Daymob is, I'd argue, like, you know, the Daymob sim is only one of, I think, a number of simulators that are on the market in the last year or two on, on various aspects of PIM, PNM, and POM. So that helps, right? Actually having the tools instead of having to create them from scratch, that was, I think, a big barrier. The second thing is, I think, as architects, we're used to dealing with the hardware problems. And it's not like coherence is out of our wheelhouse, right? But um, accelerators have often been a place where we can you know, look at applications and see opportunities for benefits, right? We're used to building accelerators. We were used to building accelerators before PIM came around. And while there are some differences with PIM, a lot of stuff still looks the same, right? So it's not to say that it's the easier way out, but I certainly think that it's much more feasible to you know, apply the same you know, methodology we've used in the past to be able to get these types of you know, new uh, accelerator architectures out as papers. Um, but I'd argue that we need more people focusing on the hard problems. Yes, it's harder to get papers. Yes, it takes more time. Yes, there's a much bigger risk for failure. But you know, if somebody doesn't do this, all those accelerator papers that people are writing are going to be for naught. Because those solutions need to be, you know, like, like we need coherent solutions. We need you no know, memory virtualization problems. We need control for problems all to be solved, right? Without solutions to all of that, um, yeah, it's great that you built an accelerator. Who's actually going to use it, right? <laughs> it's going to be such a complex model to have to do. And again, this is, you know, this is the same stuff that the uh, accelerator community for you know, the conventional accelerator community based early on, right? And there were a lot of works looking at how to accelerate things, only a handful of works looking at, you know, APIs, programming languages, on sort of like our, our support for things like virtual memory and all that, right? And in the accelerator community, we've admittedly, I think, come to a middle ground where there are some frameworks that allow you to do these things, but a lot of it is being lifted by the drivers, and by APIs, as opposed to really interacting directly with the program, right? So it's very much, you know, offload, work, spit out an answer, come back to the model. Right? And that can work for some things, but it's often very limiting. And particularly for PUM, where they you know, look at applications, many applications don't always benefit from doing everything on PUM, right? You want to split them up and do some of the work on the CPU. I can't just use the offload model anymore, right? There's interaction, there's shared data. There are a lot of things that have to come into play that uh, we really need to think about that we, you know, um, like if we don't do that, then, no, you're fundamentally basically an accelerator and you're punting a lot of the like bigger benefits that you can get, whether you realize it or not. Thanks a lot, so I got really motivational. 
like being work on being myself is uh, those hard problems are the ones that are the more interesting to me actually. Um, and I I think the overall idea is to not get overwhelmed about all of those problems and pick your favorite one and break it down and try to build up one by one as the system as the huge system that you have today has built being built up piece by piece over many 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 years, right? So absolutely, and then that's an excellent way to look at it, right? Like. We're not asking you to solve the entire software stack at once. In fact, yeah. it's very, very difficult, right? But we can make incremental progress towards making that happen one piece at a time. Yeah. Right. And I think if we, yeah, it will require some rewriting and eventually someone's going to have to stitch them all together, right? But people should be thinking about those siloed problems, right? I think, you know, again, coming back to the ISA, I think the ISA is a huge enabler in that. And that's something that, you know, it's not going to be perfect the first time around. It never is, right? And that's fine. But we need something to build off of, right? Something that's a sort of a, a lingua franca between, you know, the hardware and the software. Yeah. But besides that, once we have that in place, yeah, work on your work on a small piece, right? That's how we've done it in the past, right? You have to remember when we look at the OS, the compilers, the programming models. That's yeah, seventy years of the development and computing, right? All put together. We can't reinvent it overnight. We have to start with simple systems, but eventually we can put the pieces together to build something that's, you know, maybe not as nuanced as a current CPU, but can still handle many of these data parallel problems that we want to. Yeah, thanks so much. I, got I think there is a question in the room. Yeah, I do. Right. Uh, I got a great talk. I just got a sure. I mean, it's more of a hypothetical question, but yeah. be interested in knowing your perspective on this. So do you think it's possible to have something like plug and play improvements when it comes to PIM? Imagine that I'm running a data center and someone comes up to me and says, oh, buy my, buy my PIM accelerator, just plug it in. You don't need to do anything. And you would immediately see energy efficiency improvements. Do you think these kind of systems are possible or do you think these kind of systems are desirable? So the cheap answer is, yeah, they're possible. That's exactly what Samsung's doing today with uh, Apple Vault, right? No, but then Samsung does want you to recompile the application, right? No, you're saying without compilation, even. Okay, well, okay, let's, all right. I mean, yeah, sure. All of these are different perspectives, but yeah, we can include compilation, we cannot include compilation, but is this possible or is it truly desirable? Do we want minimal changes? Or do we want? It, does that does that make sense? It's a hard question to answer, right? Because I think a lot of it depends on the application themselves and how much of the flow you need to think about. Um, in an ideal world, right, drop in would be amazing, right? Um, because I think it would allow us to, you know, to basically give benefits for free, much like you know, new generations of CPUs could for the longest time. There are some practical limitations to that, though, right? Um, for example, given that they're not really meant for data parallel operations, I'd argue that existing ISAs for CPUs are fundamentally a bad fit for a lot of what POM wants to do. You could maybe get away with it for processing near memory in certain types of configurations, um, but it's very difficult. Now, there is some work. Um, uh, HPC 2021 uh, out of Cornell from uh, Jose Martinez and Chris Batten, they looked at um, a POM accelerator in SRAM that used the RISC-V vector ISA. And maybe that's a nice middle ground, right? Where maybe there's a chance you can get some sort of integration that could um, allow you to essentially either target like a regular vector unit or this um, pump stuff. The downside though, is that that type of approach means that the places you use data parallel in your regular application are also the ones that you wanna benefit for PIM. And it's not clear that that's going to be the obvious choice, right? Because it's one thing to do data parallel computations for the sake of doing bulk compute on the CPU side. And it's another thing to do data parallel operations to reduce data movement. There's some overlap, but it's not, it's far from 100% overlap by any means. And so 
Yeah, I don't know. I mean, drop-in stuff has a lot of limitations, but you have to have you know, some sort of hook that allows you to either, you know, in the runtime, quickly dispatch your instructions over to, you know, let's say the PIM side, right? At that point, there's a lot of runtime analysis. For example, you know, um, works like the PIM enabled instructions try to do things that in instruction granularity, but I think that unless your instructions are complex, like what they were proposing, single instructions can be very difficult to dispatch. So you need to know how much dispatch, how much shared data is there. You know, at runtime, just punting it over to a drop-in device can be difficult, right? You haven't optimized for any one particular system. And that leads to the other thing. While it may be the easiest for the programmers, that one just might be one step too far because we miss out on so many uh, optimization opportunities that really need to be there because it's not like we're sticking to the von Neumann computing model computing anymore, right? And yet that's what all these programs are written under the assumption of. And so, you know, that change, there are ways where we can be closer to some aspects of the von Neumann computing model, like with what Duality Cache did and looking at CUDA. Um, but it's difficult to, you know, just take that wholesale and make it work without changing a single thing, right? Somewhere, I think there's need for that to change. Maybe it's at the runtime. Maybe it's at the library interface as far as recompilation. Maybe it's the compiler itself. I suspect that, you know, for some of the things we're looking at, we think that the easiest place to do the monitoring to be at the compiler level because the compiler has a lot of insight into, you know, data, uh, basically like which operands are being used when and what the dependency chains are in ways that we're often reproducing on the fly in hardware or in the OS. Well, we're not really doing in OS, we're doing the hardware most of the time, but um, that it's essentially like, if we stick to drop in, are we gonna give up so much of the benefits that um, you know it's actually not gonna give you an advantage? And that to me, I don't know, it's an open question. But I do know that there's a huge loss in improvements that you'll see. Okay, sounds great. Um, just a quick follow-up since we're on the topic. You mentioned that you are of the favor that compiler is one place where we could put this. Mm -hmm. What about putting this in the hyper in the hypervisor? Or I mean, there are different parts of the software stack. I mean, you could even argue that you can put it in the microarchitectures decoder. So what just a very, very brief look into what do you believe is the which place in the stack has the maximum opportunity to put this thing in? I think it's a compiler. That's what we're, that's one of the areas we're looking at because think about what you just said, right? With the microarchitecture, for example. Yeah, sure, we do dependency analysis there to figure out out of order uh, instructions. It's already not good enough for data parallel operations. We don't use that to feed and auto populate you no know, vector units in our CPUs, for example, right? Because again, you're taking what was written inherently for sequential and maybe you know ILP harvesting code and trying to extract the data level parallelism. We've tried and it's been difficult to make that happen in the past. Right? There's no reason why it would be any better here today. And fundamentally, these architectures thrive on data parallelism. Um, it's hard to do these, you know, like, like what we're exposing, even with processing your memory, is huge amounts of bandwidth that you know, allows us to get a ton of data and a ton of work done in parallel. Fast parallel maybe gets us just somewhere in the, to an intermediate realm where that could be more feasible, but even the task parallel models that are out there require, you know, currently rely on some form of data parallelism to be able to extract. And so, so yeah, I think the microarchitecture is perhaps a difficult place for this to, to make sense in. Hypervisors and runtimes, they could, but they're not really doing this level of analysis right now for the most part, right? They're really managing macro level issues in the CPU and threads, as opposed to these like, you know, sort of, individual data level decisions. Um, and so you'd be adding in a whole new set of logic that's not really there, which would significantly encumber your hypervisors. Um, and that's not, of course, you know, that's ignoring the fact that a lot of systems don't have hypervisors. The edge, right, edge computing devices often won't have hypervisors. In fact, they'll have very, very minimal, like, you know, OSs or kernels that are running on them. Some may even run in like close to bare metal mode. And so a hypervisor could work, but it would be reinventing a lot of what the compiler is already, already has at its fingertips. 
Because the compiler is doing that dependency analysis, extracting the parallel. That's what a lot of the middle end is optimizing to begin with today. So, you know, we're just tapping information where it's already being extracted. Okay, so yeah, thank you for thank you for the answer. Cool. Are there I know I'm holding you guys back for more pizza, but um, <laughs> are there other questions? Are there any other questions in the room? So just not related to the process memory. Uh, and I don't have any more questions myself. Mohammed, do you have any? No. And we don't have more questions on YouTube. So, so that, thank you so much for the amazing talk and for the. No, great... thank you very much, everybody. It was really a pleasure to talk with everyone and answer all the questions. And hope to have you back uh, talk about your next works anytime soon. Absolutely. Take care. And of course, if there's any questions, please feel free to follow up with me over uh, email. I'm happy to answer things there. So, all right. Thanks so much, guys. Have a good day. Thanks. Have a good night, everybody. Bye.